The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications, connecting Virginians to their government. We're pleased to have members of the General Assembly with us this morning from the State Senate and the House of Delegates. Senator Lionel Spruill, good to see you, sir. Good morning, sir. It's good to be here. Delegate Cliff Hayes, good to see you. It's good to be here with you, Woody. Once Delegate again. Matthew James, good to see you, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, Senator Spruill, you're relatively new to the Senate. I believe this is your first session there. How has the transition been from the House to the Senate, sir? Well, 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 let's see. It's been great as far as working together, the relationship working together. But as far as um, having fun and loosening up, you can't, it's kind of stiff. You know, I, I like an old person, which I am. I can't be Cliff no more, you know. <laughs> can't say things on the floor, you know, it, but it's different. And uh, I, I think it's um, a more relaxed about it. But, I, but they get more done, in my opinion, as far as working together. So I, I'm enjoying it because I can see that we're doing things more as far as working together. So I'm happy to be there. So have you been pleased with your committee assignments? Yes. Well, yes. Um, um, yeah, but I got, I got three great committees. I'd love to have four. Uh, the only thing about the Senate is that uh, the other side, uh, that means Republican to y'all too, uh, <laughs> they have five committees. And I ask, why do they give them five committees when a one member cannot make all five? They keep the Democrats from getting important committees, so you have three. And, uh, and I learned on the Senate side they have proxy. So you can't make it so if, if he's on my committee, well, I got five committees, I never can make this committee. So I give him my proxy and he votes for me. And I, I've learned that that's different on the Senate side. But other than that, I think it's great. But I asked the question, why not give more committees if y'all really can't make five? And some members saying that I've been on five committees school, one of them I never attend. Just give my proxy to somebody but it keeps from giving the Democrats from having it. That's the only thing that I see wrong about it. But other than that, it's great, and they work together fine. And Delegate Hayes, you are new to the House of Delegates. Congratulations, sir. Well, thank you. You came from uh, local government. How has that transition been? Well, it's uh, quite a difference in the two uh, processes locally. Uh, usually you have a lot of time to ramp up uh, before issues uh, that may be con contested or sometimes challenging. Um, the difference, I would say, uh, I'd have uh, back home three or four weeks to alert members mm -hmm. of the community to come on out to City Hall in reference to something that we might be voting on. Uh, here, <laughs> I had the experience of uh, having one of my bills get notified uh, around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening that it was going to be heard the next day at 7 a.m. in subcommittee. So, as you can see, it's a, quite a difference in the uh, the amount of time that's ramped up. I'm just glad to be here though, to learn the process here. I sit here now today between uh, two bookends of uh, ex uh, extreme knowledge, uh, as I would refer to them both. Um, Senator Spruill had a lot to do with me getting here and just lending his expertise and uh, knowledge on the process of running to get in this seat. And then while here, I have the great opportunity to be with a very knowledgeable person here, experienced person, and uh, Delegate Matthew James, who is my mentor uh, as I'm learning procedurally what to do in the processes uh, that are here. So I feel doubly blessed to have these two men uh, to turn to for advice. Great. And Delegate James, uh, you are experienced, very knowledgeable. You've been around for several years now. You're on the Appropriations Committee. Why has the subcommittee process so important in the House of Delegates? Well, in, in the House, thank you. I'm happy to be here, and, and thank you, Cliff, for those kind of words. Um, most of the really detailed work occurs at subcommittee level, and uh, I always tell visitors who have bills of interest, if they really want to see how the process works and the discussion and the debate, 
you really have to come to the subcommittees and find out when they're appropriate, when, when they're assigned, because that's where we really do the heavy lifting. By the time we're seeing, you know, I think we're close to 2,000 bills in 45 days. You know, the, sub, the committees really, the full committee defers, and I don't mean that mm -hmm. negatively, mm -hmm. to the judgment of the subcommittees because that's where the vetting occurs. And so that's where we, 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 we go into detail. We do what, what I like to call the deep dive and find the details of it and to, and to find out whether or not it needs to be, uh, if it has a fiscal impact, if it has to be sent to appropriation, if it has to be re-referred to another committee because it's been placed in the wrong committee, or if it's, if it's a good bill or if it has some issues. And I think that's, that's what we always tell people. But at least on the House side, uh, that's where a lot of the vetting occurs. And so I oftentimes tell people, if they have a bill of interest, don't wait for full committee. Show up at subcommittee and then see what happens. Senator Spruill, I think you've been, uh, 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 you've had a uh, very aggressive agenda this session. I think uh, we were talking earlier, you've gotten four bills passed. Uh, from the Senate over to the House, uh, do you expect those bills to pass in the House of Delegates? One got, um, we didn't have to get killed. We put a bill in uh, yesterday pertaining to uh, the animals. Uh, let's say if you own a house and I rent it, the house from you, and the reason be I put in that uh, if you wait two weeks to inspect the house and find an animal that's been left there by the, the tenants. And so the bill, saying that you be fine for doing that. So they shift the bill around and say, no, no, to the tenants, that if you have a living animal, that tenant should know that you have an animal. A couple of days you left the animal in the house. But uh, that bill was the only one uh, that they passed by because when legislative service drew up the bill, it's already in the code for a different section of the code. But the one that they really care uh, on the Republican side, which the, the bill says that no excuse voting. And when they hear that, they get nervous when Democrats do that, you know. And for some reason, they seem to think that um, we're going to come out and fluctuate some thousands of votes. Well, you can look at it. It was dead on the robber. And I said, what's wrong with it? It keeps folks from, from telling us a lie, if I want to use that word, or oh, it could be true. Check on the box. So why are you voting early? Um, my family going to hurt tomorrow, so I'm going to vote early today. You check on the back and now two or three thousand folks. You know good and well two or three thousand people are not having some excuse why they want to vote. Because the lines are long. You know, seven o'clock the lines are long. So no excuse voting. Just pick a time to do it. But the other side, that means Republican to y'all guys. On the other side, they were saying, well, uh, so they kill those bills. So for some reason, anything that can make it easier for folks to vote, for saying to me, they kill them. But they can one out, y'all. They vote on the day. To the day, one says that uh, when you send in your uh, ballot, vote, uh, was it absentee ballot, send it in, mm -hmm. that what happened was the register asked for this to be put in. Now, I made it clear to them. I said, hey, it's not by Democrats. I said, and it's, it's not by nobody. They are saying that we are finished putting stuff in the machine. we got time now to open those things up. Put them in the machine that night. Why wait till the next day? You lose the election that night, 50 votes. Next day, you have to ballot, well, then you won. So it said that if they have the time, they do it that night. And the second one was to put one person, the public and Democrat and independents, look at the, the ballot and make sure it wasn't for clear for whoever's for. So those two are on the third reading of the day. So they seem to get out, but I, I just still question why in this country that we send of boys and girls overseas to fight for the rights of others, to have things that's voting and just anything. But in this country, we su suppress the vote, and that bothers me. And Delegate Hayes, I, I believe you had some, some uh, bills dealing with absentee voting as well, did you not? Certainly, and um, one of which uh, had to do with no excuse absentee voting for those 65 uh, mm -hmm. and older. Um, we thought since, um, as Senator Spruill mentioned so many were being killed on arrival that, well, maybe let's target someone that everybody can agree have been mm -hmm. already documented. The system knows who they are. 
and in particularly, there's a gentleman that both Senator Spruill, myself, as well as Delegate James knows as a civic league president, longtime community person, and Reverend uh, James McNeil. Mm -hmm. Reverend McNeil, uh, his example of why we ought to have no excuse absentee voting rings loudly in our community. He's a civic league president. Right now, I think he's about 95 years old. And at one of our more recent historic turnouts and elections, um, you know, it was an example of things just happen sometimes. Um, and you won't find his excuse <laughs> mm -hmm. on a list of reasons why you should absentee vote because who knew that he was going to have a fire on election day. Here he was doing his civic duty. He was taking people to the polls. He was going to go vote only to get a call that his house was on fire. And his question when I arrived to see him, he wasn't worried about the house. He said, how am I going to vote today? And so that's how important voting is to many Americans, many Virginians. They want to make sure that they're able to cast their vote. After all that they have gone through, the system knows who they are. It's clear that the system knows who James McNeil is. He's been voting as long as he could in every single election, every opportunity. Why shouldn't he be able to vote absentee? before the election. Um, again, in this case, his house caught on fire. So things happen. And, you know, now he's looking at a situation to go out to vote. Lines are extremely long. Has a walker. Mm -hmm. and, and, and picture that, you know, on election day. And again, we've seen those historic turnouts on some of these elections. And it's just, I think, after they paid their dues and committing themselves to this country, Virginia, that they ought to be recognized in some way. Even if I go to some of the coffee shops, mm -hmm. they show their appreciation by giving them a free coffee. Or maybe it's the insurance company mm -hmm. that they're involved with. Once you've been with the company for so many years, then they know who you are. You don't have to worry about your rates going up or whatever. Just as a signal of our appreciation of your commitment to this country and this community, this is what we're going to do for you. Well, we should be in a position, we're in a position, and we ought to do something to show our appreciation for them. And so we thought that that bill might be able to get a little movement, but unfortunately, it was laid gently on the table. Uh, Delegate James, yes. uh, one of the positive aspects uh, that, that the public can now take advantage of is there is an on-demand feature on the General Assembly website that allows uh, you or I or anyone else to uh, view the proceedings of the House and the Senate the day after or two weeks from now, for example. I think that's a very positive uh, development. Some people still critique the subcommittee process because, as you pointed out, they're generally at 7 a.m., number right. one, and number two, there are no recorded votes, if, if my that, memory serves. That is correct. We speak to that, sir. Uh, that that's that's why I, I encourage people. I know it's a long way, and we we've, we've tried to come up. As a matter of fact, I think a member of the House, uh, Delegate Levine, has actually started mm -hmm. a, a uh, transparency transparency caucus, caucus. and uh, we're having folks who have actually shown up to tape some of our uh, subcommittee levels. I, I I think we should be open. I believe in open government uh, because that's where a lot of the heavy lifting goes, and I, I think we need to work on that. I think that's something that going forward we probably will. As you know, we're physically transforming yes. to a new building, and hopefully the new building uh, will have some mechanism in which we may be able to address that going forward. And I'm sure, uh, as you know, the <coughs> other 99 delegates in the House <coughs> and the 40 senators are not shy about introducing legislation to address that, and I think you will see that coming forward. And we, some, we have had folks that come up for the full committee, yes, and the subcommittee in between the house and the report, and the subcommittee dies, and you sit down ready to speak, and you say, "I drove all the way up from Chesapeake to speak on the committee. We had a meeting at seven o'clock in the morning, and said, so welcome to the subcommittee, Zoom." Right. And they said, "Well, you're gonna hear it. No, it died in the subcommittee." And right. so, and that was no recorded vote. So who voted what? You don't know unless you ask somebody. You see. So, and that, that was one thing I, I do believe that. Maybe if it's recorded, 
and see it, that you can see how these folks uh, will vote. And a lot of times you can, uh, I don't know what it still used to be, can you get somebody self-committed to bring a bill back on the floor if it fails, self-committed? It's at the chairman's request. Okay. The chair, the chair of the full committee can sometimes, depending on the rules, uh, which change every year, they can bring a bill back up to full committee. But, but when you have, um, like the chairperson of uh, p and &E, for example, they take all those bills, P and E and privileges, yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, that's all the Democratic bills. That's what it amounts to. Uh, they won't say I'm gonna say it for them. All the Democratic, put them all in one basket. And zoom. Now, some said, these go to the motion. You know, show them. You know. So you say, well, you take in, you roll them all into Cliff Hayes' bill because his bill is similar to yours. You see, but it's not the same, but it's similar. It deal with the same type subject, but it's different. But they roll them all into his bill, then he presents it. The, then you kill them all. You see, and uh, so, but they have had one or two, I was told, that uh, there had been some complaints and they pulled them up because they found out there were one or two that were different mm -hmm. and they had to uh, listen to those. So I'm saying at least if you could kill them, go to the motion or hurt me anyway. Don't roll mine to his beard before you can kill it. That seems to be a fundamental impediment then to getting an independent or bipartisan redistricting commission, for example. Uh, because of the fate those bills often receive in subcommittee here in the, in the you know in the House of Delegates. Yes, yeah, it's quite interesting. I guess with from a technology background, I look at these processes as empowering uh, the citizens across the Commonwealth, and I, I think every so often as I guess ten years or so as this every ten years, every ten years every ten you years. start right. to look at uh, redistricting after uh, there's been. Uh, you know, the federal process of the census count. Um, now, with open government, big data, I mean, now the citizens are empowered because objectively people are able to grab data and numbers and see population trends and growth, and they can model and simulate themselves on what an objective district ought to look like. Whereas before, it used to be the specialists and the folks here that had access to the data and information and, you know, it was much easier for them to crunch on their own. But now that the uh, citizenry uh, and the populace here is more equipped and empowered to run scenarios themselves, it gets quite interesting, uh, you know, hearing proposals sure. uh, coming from the public. Delegate James, let's take uh, advantage of your experience this session on the Appropriations Committee. We, we've heard about a $1.5 billion deficit. We've heard about uh, potential raises for teachers and law enforcement personnel. What's happening with uh, those matters? Well, I can, I can speak for the House budget. I think we came out with a structurally balanced budget under the leadership of Chairman Jones. I think we, we with a limited amount of money, everyone knows the revenue shortfall we had, we came up with a pretty good budget, budget that's balanced. We, we were able to give raises to uh, several of the state employees as well as the uh, state troopers and, uh, and, and we were able to uh, come up with a uh, what I think is a fair solution to the city to this portion issue of 1.7 million gap that was created as we transitioned uh, with the Virginia Port buying uh, the MERS property, we had a hole in our budget of about 1.7 million, and in the House budget, hopefully it will survive on the Senate side, uh, we were able to uh, come up with a uh, Treasury loan of about 1.7 million for three years, and then once that's uh, done, the city will have taxable property of new purchases that mm -hmm. will repay that. So I think it's a fair budget, uh, it's, and I always say a, a good compromise is nobody's really happy but everybody's satisfied, and I think that that's what we put on the table. I think we only had $1.9 million of money unused, so we left a little bit of wiggle room there. And uh, the budget conferees are meeting this week with the Senate, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, we have to have a balanced budget. And uh, my hope is that uh, we'll come to some solutions, and which we always strive to do, and we'll be able to leave early, and then we present the budget to the governor next week. Senator, how important are those teacher raises in, in your district? You have about 200,000 constituents yes. now. Yes, um, 225. 
it's very important because they were promised it last year. I believe that to help me out. They promised last year because of sea frustration, the right word for it, yeah, that right. kicks in. So now all of a sudden we had to pull it back. And a lot of folks don't understand why. So you got to understand is that in Virginia, the law requires that we have a balanced budget. And uh, in California, for example, their debt is $90 billion. Their debt is more than our budget. What is our budget, roughly? Uh, uh, is it, is it not $90 billion? But it's their a little debt, south of, yeah, 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 it's almost. Of. So their debt is in California is more than our whole state. Right. But in our law, says we have a balanced budget. So the governor had to pull back. So to kind of suffice that he came up with a, a um, uh, bonus. No, 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 no. So the House and the Senate both this time came up with the 3% uh, for state employees, 2% for local employees. And so it's important just because they're really hard and said that y'all are not keeping your commitment. That if you want to keep good teachers then, keep good people in the fire department, state troopers then, you got to pay them a decent salary because they get trained and they go somewhere else. So it's really important this time. So I do agree that the House budget is a little bit better than the Senate budget. So I'm hoping that when the two get it, not that far off that they can't fix it. But I do agree that the House budget this time is a little bit better than the Senate budget as far as giving back to for teachers and what have you. So it's much better, I think, than the Senate budget. So I'm hoping that, that we can kind of give in and go with the House budget because they really need it. Um. Delegate Hayes, talk to us. I want, I want to draw on your experience in, in, in technology and talk to us about this issue about cybersecurity and the kinds of jobs that are out there, even for high school students who gain uh, certifications in that regard. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk, and it just seems to be in vogue nowadays to uh, touch on the term of cybersecurity and how important STEM is. And so we throw these terms around. Um, now, they are very, very critical careers um, for our country, for the Commonwealth, uh, but we have to make sure that we understand how specialized these areas are for those who are being trained. Um, uh, Delegate uh, James is, I would consider, an expert when it comes to dealing with workforce development. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that we have a workforce that's ready for those employers that we have here in the Commonwealth. And then when it's time for us to recruit and go after other companies to bring to the Commonwealth, uh, one of the things they want to know is what uh, type of workforce uh, do you have? Who's prepared for those jobs of the future or even the jobs of today? And when it comes to cybersecurity, we need to make sure that we're investing and putting, you know, real investment in training these young people and preparing them for the jobs of the future. Now, it's not enough just to put that investment in them, but in the classroom, in our community colleges, in our um, uh, larger in um, institutions of higher learning, as well as K through 12, we need to make sure that we're investing on in those people who will be training them. We need to make sure that we have the right folks who are there training them and preparing them for those careers so that those companies who are going to be hiring have a certain level of confidence in that workforce that's coming and being prepared. So it's twofold. Not only do we need to invest in having structured course loads for them and preparing them there, but we also need to make sure that we invest in those who will be training our workforces as well. So you'll see partnerships, I think, with the learning environment and also our corporate or business partners coming together to help in that regard. And Delegate James, I think it's true that you are a recognized expert in, in terms of economic development and workforce training. Uh, Go Virginia is just getting started, for example. Can you talk to us about that process? Oh, absolutely. I think one of the things I think both uh, the House and the Senate, uh, we voted to restore the full funding for Go Virginia because I think that's going to be uh, the engine that's going to really help the state. Uh, as a, the Delegate Hayes has talked about and, and, uh, and Senator Spruill, you know, we, we, we need to develop these partnerships and more importantly, we need to work collaboratively around regions. Uh, one of the bills I was a chief co-patron on basically offered incentives for cities and counties mm -hmm. to come together. 
Uh, and we need to do that because the private sector and the public sector have to work together because if we don't work with the workforce, if we don't have a prepared workforce, uh, we, in my mind, are going to never fulfill our economic opportunities that we have in front of us. Because companies are not going to stay, companies are not going to stay, and they're not going to be attracted to a workforce that's not ready to take those jobs. So I think Go Virginia is a good start. Uh, you'll probably see a lot more legislation that's coming in, 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 in fold. And I think that uh, that leadership is going to, and one of the things I'd be remiss if I didn't tell the folks at home, is l understand the process. Regional, uh, regional councils are being formed right now. Uh, in March, they'll be sort of starting to certify. But come July 1, they're going to start looking at grants statewide to spend the money to do workforce development and economic development programs, addressing many of the things that uh, uh, Cliff has talked about and the Senate has talked about. Great. So get ready. If you haven't, if you don't know who's on that council or what's the process, go on the website or contact one of us and we can tell you. Great. Senator Spruill, we've got about a minute and a half left. I wanted to give you an opportunity, sir, to talk about one of your former colleagues who you worked with closely on the House side. Um, go ahead. That's the delegate John and Joanna, which they, they knew him very well. And uh, we honored him on both sides of the House. That he was in the House first, then went in the Senate and lost and came back to the House. We liked him because John was a person that if he gave you his word, he stayed there. And he didn't pay any attention to whether a Republican or a Democrat. If it's a bill that he really felt that was right, and everybody agreed that go to Johnny, he would tell you his opinion. He did not play politics on a lot of things. And sometimes they say that was his damn fault because he was on one side or the other side. No, Johnny was Johnny Joanna, and he was the person of, uh, who kept his word. He was the person from the America. But I need a lawyer. He, like I said, he had me, he wouldn't even charge me because he said, no, you're a friend of mine. And he did a whole lot for a friend. And so we all love Johnny up here because he's the guy who really believed in what he was doing. He did not play politics. He stuck to his guns. But when he liked it or not, he was there. So we both sides of the aisle really love and respect him for that. Great. Uh, you get the last word, freshman. Great. Right. 30 seconds on yeah. transportation needs. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know how important transportation is across the Commonwealth, and we're doing some great things uh, as regions work together to deal with the transportation woes, if you will, across the Commonwealth. But we know that transportation is going to be uh, uh, an economic driver for us if we can get our goods uh, from the ports onto the shelves in our stores. That's important. Great. Thank you all for being here. Senator Lionel Spruill, good to see you, sir. Delegate Cliff Hayes, Delegate Matthew James, keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans.